Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. We have Jason's mother with us. God bless you. So great to have you with us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. A couple back here. I, God bless you. So glad you're with us this morning. Uh, appreciate it. Yes. <clears throat> Brother Hernandez is going to come to this pulpit. I ask you, do you want to hear from God? That was kind of light. That's because you know that he hears from God. That is very respectful also because when somebody hears from God, uh, you know, when the people heard the rumbling on top of the mountain, they said, um, uh, Moses, you, you go here for us. You go for us, and you tell us what he said, because I'm not really sure I want to hear from him myself as the top of the mountain shakes and lightning and thundering. And If God says something to you, it will be the greatest thing that you could ever hear. It may be chastisement. It may be direction. It may be favor and blessing. But whatever it is, it will be exactly what you and I need to hear. Are you willing to receive that today? Say, God anoint Brother Hernandez and help anoint us as we receive the word of God. Welcome him to this pulpit in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Betcher. Who hath believed our report? The prophet said. He's talking about a report that would come, not a report that was there. So he asked the question 700 plus years prior to the manifestation of it. You know, it's interesting. We were singing that song, The Great I Am. And I thought, you know, it's interesting people that want to believe in two or three gods, triunities or things, multiplicities or polytheistic, which is second century, uh, Christianity struggle because they had Greeks and uh, different cultures coming in that weren't raised with hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Jews were raised with that, not the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are trying to understand God and they're trying to do it through the eyes of philosophy. And so they're having a hard time grasping the oneness of God because they've been trained all their lives with polytheistic views in Egypt and Greek and Greece and Rome. They've all had a polytheistic foundations, so they're trying to comprehend God, kind of like people in Chicago. They're trying to understand the oneness of God through the lens of philosophy, of vain deceits, and so they are trying to put parameters of this God that's one and as we're singing, I thought, you know, it's it's not hard to really understand it if you want to because God loved us so much that he sent somebody else. That makes zero sense. I love you so much, I'll send somebody else to help you. Oh, thanks. I know how much you love me now. God loved us so much that he wrapped himself in flesh to do it himself. That, that's the simplest I can communicate to a philosophical brain without you getting a revelation. And Isaiah says 700 years prior, do you believe what I'm telling you? Will you believe it in 700 years plus? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah 53. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. When, when you see him, there'll be no beauty. There'll be no vain glory. It won't be an Elvis Presley. 
there's no beauty that you, the attraction won't be because he looks good. He'll be despised. He'll be rejected of men. He'll be a man of sorrows. He'll be acquainted with grief so nobody can say he doesn't understand what I'm going through. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. You know, the crucifix movie tried to display it the most gruesome possible. It probably got close. He was despised. We esteemed him not. I wouldn't want him preaching in my pulpit. He doesn't look that good. Doesn't look like a TV preacher. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken. We looked at him and said, wow, does God even love him? Spent of God not realizing it is God manifest in flesh. Afflicted, wounded for what? For our transgression. Bruised for what? For our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace upon him for what? So we could have peace. And then ultimately, with his stripes, where the blood's flowing from, where the blood is dripping off his body, where the blood is like streams and trickles of rivers coming off of his feet, as they touch the soil of that ground. From the moment he's been brutally beaten by 39 stripes that practically rip his body to shreds because of the cat of nine tails that had little shreds of glass built into the leather and every time he pulled it, it pulled a hunk of flesh off his body and with those stripes, you're healed. Your ears pop open. With those stripes, your disease disappears. With those stripes, healing begins to metabolize into your frame and God begins to heal your body. You know, my subject is this morning, miracles. Miracles that people need and want, but no, don't know how to get them. Don't know how to get from their need to his miracle, from their tragedy to his miracle, from their crisis, from their wounds, from their childhood afflictions, from their insubordinate state because of what went wrong in their life and now they use it as a defense mechanism. And the coverings that people walk around with are the displays of hell's communication that convince them that God can't fix that part. So they only bring the parts that they think God can fix. It's hard for them to admit and bring the parts that God knows he can fix. The hardest parts, the parts that don't give praise to God, the parts that don't raise their hands before God, the parts that cannot communicate with God because those parts are the impossibilities that he came to heal today. All we like sheep have gone astray. Don't consider yourself higher than somebody else. We have turned everyone his own way. America's the greatest proponent of his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He can be seated. You've been standing a while. He was afflicted, not like us, yet he opened not his mouth. When we get oppressed and afflicted, we tell everybody. When we get blessed and healed, we tell nobody. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Imagine standing before over a hundred critics that stand there to judge you and accuse you 
and speak lies against you. And he says not a word. 18 hours of criticism is what's calculated approximately what he went through as he didn't even retaliate with one word. Why? So somebody could get healed. So somebody could get delivered. So somebody could get set free. So please don't interrupt me when I see a God coming to reveal himself and heal somebody. Please don't stop that individual that says, I've got a need and I don't know how to get there, but I'm going to get there today because, God, I see blood coming off that cross and it's about to heal me. It's about to restore me. It is in the process of now converting a portion of my being that I thought perceivably could not be converted. But all of a sudden, the healer is descending off a bloody cross in order for just a drop of that blood blood to transcend human logic and heal me heal me heal me heal me somebody shout it shout it again would you do it one more time You hear that, God? Somebody wants to be healed, and thus somebody is going to be healed. Anytime you want to, son, get out of the wheelchair. Why? Because healing is already in the house. Anytime you want to, go ahead and let your ears pop open. Why? Because healing is already in the house. Anytime you want to, step into your miracle. Why? Because healing is already in the house. Why? For by his stripes, you were healed. And in the spirit world, God already sees you in your miracle. God already sees you in the manifestation thereof. (laughs) You know what it looked like? Let me show you. Give me a second. It looked kind of like that. Where'd it go? It looked kind of like this moment of time that cannot be described. And I couldn't explain it to you as much as I've tried to explain it to others. It's called shingles of the optical nerve. It hit me just after I left here last year. I cannot describe the sleepless nights. I would finally pass out somewhere around four or five in the morning. Only to need to get up the next day and come up with something that the Lord would want to speak to his people. Because you see, I was in New York. I wasn't at home. I couldn't call in sick. Not like you with your job and position. and No. You see, I was on a mission. Can you zoom in on that? I don't know if you can do that. That's what it looked like. Can you see it from there? That's what I looked like preaching in New York to 700 Latins in a district conference. Oh, man, you shouldn't have preached like that. Why? He hung like that. Why? So somebody could be healed. So somebody could be delivered. So somebody could get what God wanted to facilitate inside of that meeting that day. So I'd hang out. I I didn't really think about it because I couldn't even think. I, I didn't know which position to sleep in. And so I tried to lay down, not realizing that when I laid down, the blood actually would go closer to my head and make feel like my head was going to pop. 
And, and so that would keep me awake until finally I was so exhausted I'd pass out. Then I'd try to get up and I couldn't study. I, I couldn't read. I, could, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't think. So I'd sit there in the presence of God. I asked the Lord one of those days of those three days of preaching. I said, God, well, what do I do? What, should I go home? What, what do I do? And the Lord came in my room pretty strongly. And he said, what did Paul do? After he was beaten and left for dead, I said, he got up and preached. He went to the next town and preached. Please don't look at your situation as impossible. It's not. The healer's in the room. It's not. And I'm not trying to compare what I went through with anything else. God forbid, not what he went through. I'm simply trying to help you understand that whatever it is that you have crisis in your life that's categorically, amen, in a place where God can't get to it because you have deemed it unhealable. God is telling you, bring it out today. I'm going to heal it. Bring it to the surface today. I want to redeem it. Bring it to the forefront today. I want to salvage it. I want to restore it. I want to deal with it. Oh, clap your hands. The healer, the miracle worker is in the house. His house. Jesus, the healer. God, that provider of blood, sacrificial offering in order to make provision for somebody's failure because of his love, because of his sacrifice. There is a covering that wants to come over you. There's a scripture in the Bible. It's intriguing to me. It simply says in Genesis 3 and 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. And I thought, did they really know what was about to happen at that particular juncture? They really didn't or they would have got close to God. If they would have known, I'm about to be healed. I am about to be restored. I'm about to be covered by a sacrifice. I'm about to be handled by the God of heaven who is the God full of mercy. They would not have been hidden behind a tree. But they didn't believe that, Robbie. They thought the God that's coming close is coming for other reasons. But God thought the God that's coming close is coming for one reason. You need healing, and I'm bringing a covering because hell has exposed you to what I did not want you exposed to yet. So, I will become your propitiation. I will come in order to heal you. So Adam and Eve, in desperation, create a covering because who wants to come before God naked? Nobody. You don't even want to go in public naked. I hope you say amen. My Lord, where am I? <laughs> Let me try that again. We got a serious issue here, Pastor. We don't even like to go in public naked. Phew. 
I was getting nervous there for a second, Brother Jason. <laughs> and they had lost their clothing because their clothing was the glory of God. They weren't naked. God's not going to create something that he creates it and puts it out there naked. Their clothing was the glory of God. When they saw their self naked, it's because they lost their clothes. Their clothes were the glory of God. They lost it, and so they thought, we need to cover, because that's what innocent people do that have a crisis in their life that are now no longer innocent, and it exposes them. What's the first thing you want to do? Cover yourself. So they do. The problem is their wardrobe isn't from heaven now. They've been communicating with hell. So now their wardrobe, they've been communicating with a worldly spirit. So now their wardrobe is from hell. So the only thing they can do is cover themselves with their most recent conversation. Fear, shame, guilt, condemnation, confusion, and hiding. It's called twigs, scraps of broken branches, fallen leaves, frail twigs, and they attempt to make some kind of covering. In the spirit world, it's called fear, shame, guilt, condemnation, confusion, hiding, all that came from hell, not heaven. But that's the only thing they felt like they could associate with based on the deficiency that happened. So God shows up in verse 21. And he sacrifices an animal and blood is spilt and God makes coats of skin. Imagine what that must have looked like. God making coats of skin, a spirit becoming a seamstress. <laughs> Why? Because they couldn't see him. He was a spirit. And all of a sudden, this animal goes dead. He skins it in less than a minute. Better than a deer hunter. Without knives. Say, how did he do it? Who cares? I would have loved to have been there to watch it. I've skinned several deer at this point. I'd have loved to have seen that. Like, God, you talk about supernatural. Show up in the middle of my hunting season. Help me out here. That'd be awesome to watch. And all of a sudden, <laughs> and two coats are hanging there. Put them on. Why? But wait, you can't put them on. Why? You still got issues. I'm trying to cover you. But before I cover you, I want to cleanse you. Because what's the good of you becoming a Christian? In covering yourself with the same broken branches and twigs. And you're still hurting. You still got pain. You still have trouble. You still can't submit. You still have personality problems. And you're not cleansed. And you're not healed. Why would I cover you like that? I'd rather cleanse you first. That when I do cover you, so let me cleanse you. Why? Because I have to fix what the devil destroyed with false communication, false doctrine, false perceptions, false philosophies. Doesn't let you see me for who I am. 
You heard God speak today prophetically. He said, I am the same one that died for you on the cross. I am that I am. I'm the same one that talked to Moses and reiterated it in John. I am that I am. Why? Here's why. Let me tell you why. When you preach on the oneness of God, you'll get the greatest miracles ever. Why? Because the oneness of God is the unity of God. It is the greatest dimension of unity. And when you have the greatest dimension of unity, ask Sister Freeman, who was a missionary since it's Missionary Sunday, who was a missionary to Africa, and the one time that she ministered, speaking to people, levitated off the ground while she was speaking, was when she was in the atmosphere of unity in Ethiopia. Because unity releases the greatest dimension that comes off the one throne that's in heaven. There's only one in heaven. Dr. Rapaki tried to tell a group of people, and I was there, I heard him. He tried to tell them he had a vision of three thrones in heaven. Whoops, that's not right. That doesn't equal with the word. There's only one throne in heaven. There's only one who sits upon that throne. Amen. And his name is, it's wonderful. That's right, it's everlasting. It's counselor. Isaiah said it like this. His name shall be called wonderful, counselor, one of the gods. What? 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 The mighty God. The everlasting father. The what? The prince of peace. Mm-hmm. Of his kingdom. There'll be no end. That's why when you get to talking about this one God whose name is Jesus, it's the most powerful understanding because it was that one God who came and caused a sacrifice what, so he could send another God to do a different sacrifice, to be a second Adam? That's philosophy. God said, I'm showing you. Adam and Eve didn't know about 4,000 years from that moment. Who cares? You know what people care about? What they're going through right now. That's what people care about. You think Eve cared when God said, when you birth a child, you're going to have great labor and you're going to bruise his head and he's going to bruise your heel. You're going to bruise his heel. He's going to bruise your head, right? You think she cared that that was going to be 4,000 years later? She didn't care. She's hurting. She's got issues of her own right now. She wants her stuff fixed like we want our stuff fixed. She doesn't care about prophecy about us. She cares about, hey, is there something you can do right now to get me out of this great mess? Yes, I may have caused, but I want out of it because I'm tired of what it's done to me. So God gives her a command. You see, some people think, well, you know, he judged her. And that's why he told her that. Well, use your brain for a second. And I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying, use your mind for a second and think, when has God ever given a command for the purpose of condemnation? God doesn't give commands for the purpose of condemnation. God gives commands for the purpose of deliverance. For the purpose of blessing. 
Why, he even said it in Deuteronomy 28. I will command the blessing upon you. He says it in Psalms 133. I will command these blessings upon you. Why? Because a command is designed to deliver. A command is designed to bless you. A command is designed to get you out of Egypt and get you out of the philosophies of Egypt. A command is designed to get you out of this worldly culture and get you into heaven's culture. God looked at Eve and he gave her a command. God looked at Satan and he gave him a command. He said, I know you're standing now, but from now on, you won't be standing. You'll go on your belly. And every time you crawl around, you will remember where this happened and what it means. Now, he gives Adam a command. You'll till the ground the rest of your life to the day you die by the sweat of your brow will be the reason you have harvest upon your table. Now think about it. How many days a week did Adam work? Every day. Why? There was no Sabbath. Yet. So he worked seven days a week. And some people complain about five. Or four. And eight hours a day. Come on. <laughs> this guy worked from sun up till sundown. Thank God he didn't live in Alaska. <laughs> this guy worked hard to the point of sweat. Some of you don't even sweat at work. Brother Stephen, do you sweat at work? Depends on what's happening. But not like that. It's not coming off your brow. He said off your brow. He didn't say under your arms. That's what you're talking about when you think sweat under your arms. I'm talking about it dripping off your face. He's working hard. Do you think that God commanded that so every time he dug a shovel into the ground, he could think of what he did wrong? God didn't send that command upon his life to judge him. He sent that command so every time he put his shovel in the ground, he would remember he covered me. That is the moment he covered me. That's the moment he took that coat and put it around me. Every time she was birthing Abel and she's in great labor, she's thinking, oh, God, I failed. God, this is horrible. You don't know God. When she was birthing Abel and she was birthing Cain, what was triggered in the memory was not what they did wrong, was how God came at that moment and he covered them and had mercy on them. I know why you're not clapping your brains. Amen, taking a backward lap right now, trying to perceive. You see, the world tries to paint commandment as a legalism to try to tell you it's going to make you feel bad. You shouldn't live that way. You shouldn't dress that way. You shouldn't talk that way. You shouldn't act that way. You shouldn't go to that church. Why? Because the world wants you to think that that branding is going to be for your condemnation. Let me help you a little bit here. That branding is for your salvation. God's trying to tell you, hey, when you do this, it's going to remind you how I saved you. It's going to remind you how I redeemed you. It's going to remind you how I rescued you. It's going to remind you how I restored you. Oh, clap your hands. Amen. By the tape, if you're not getting this, God is trying to help you understand. Shh. 
Leviticus says, as God's creating the law, 1425. Now remember, the first sacrificial offering that was given and that was done was for the purpose of what? Covering. Here, I'll help you. Covering. So think about it. Why does then God use the order of the law wrapped around perpetual sacrificial offerings? You got to go back to the original. That's the way you study theology. Always go back to the original setting. That sets the foundation for everything else he's going to say. That's the way you study the Bible. Go to Genesis, find the original, and then you take everything from that module. Go to Acts, study the Bible, then you take everything from that module. It sets the precedence. That's the reason John opened his book with, in the beginning, was the word. That's why Genesis opens in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, and he gives you the structure. So that's the preface. So you always go back to the beginning of what was done in order to set the foundation of why everything else like that patterns it. So every offering that you see here is not for the purpose of legalism. Every off offering that God talks about is for the purpose of covering something. He says it right here. He shall kill the lamb, the trespass offering, and the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of the right hand of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot from head to toe. He said, what I'm trying to communicate to you is every offering is not designed to remind you of what is wrong in your life. Every offering is designed to remind you how I'm going to cover you. That's the reason that tithes and offering become so huge. Why? Because now giving, on, giving takes on a completely different set of parameters. Every time I give an offering, I'm reminding God he's going to cover me. Some of you didn't get that. Every time I put an offering in the offering plate and I'm paying my tithes, I'm not giving God 10%. I'm not giving God 20%. I'm sending heaven a signal. I understand you covered me and I'm letting the spirit world know I'm covered. I'm covered. I'm covered. I'm, some of you don't want to clap and I know why, but go ahead and clap because you're getting a revelation. And God is trying to trigger something. It revolutionized my thinking when I saw this. Pastor, not that I was, I didn't have trouble giving. I've never had trouble giving. Because I don't own anything. Not because I'm an evangelist. I don't own anything because... Everything's his, I read. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the land thereof. So I'm just a manager over what he gives me. So how can I make an owner's decision when I'm just a manager? You know what happens on your job when you do that? You get fired. You're just a manager and you tell God, hey, this is what I'm going to do with your money. God says, oh, really? Did I say that and I forgot? <laughs> See, some of you don't want to say amen because you think you're the owner. Amen. You're not the owner. We're just the managers. We're just there to manage how he blesses us. Because it's like I told pastor, you'll pay your tithes one way or another. You can either pay them in the church or pay them to the auto mechanic. It just make your pick. Take your pick. You can either pay him to the church or pay him in your taxes.
This depends who you want to get the money. You make that decision. I can't help you with that. But I can tell you this, that every time you do it, it triggers something in the heavens. I was in a little, I was in a little, uh, it was a youth camp. It was a junior youth camp. And, and a pastor got up during the offering and he said, now, young people, I know you don't have any money. He said, but I know you have some money and I know it's attached to your food and because uh, you're at camp. You don't bring money to camp unless you're going to eat. I and mean, that's the reason you bring money to camp. You don't bring it to give it in the offering. Listen, I was a camper, I know. Mom gave us money to eat. I mean, they gave us some offering money, but that was the lower end of the totem pole. Amen. The, the major, you can say amen, because we all know it's true they've been to camp. Praise the Lord. And he says, but I want to dig into your food money. He said, because when you give it, something's going to be loosed here. They, those kids started coming up and giving offerings that you knew good and well, that was their food money. And some of them gave all their food money. About that time, something shifted in the spirit world, and I thought, now why was that? Why did something happen in the spirit world just off people giving 20s and 10s and, and 5s? Well, it's not the money. I mean, come on, let's just be honest. There wasn't dollar bills before 1970-something that were the highest value system. The value system in America was commodities, gold and silver or whatever other commodity you had to equal a particular amount of currency. That was what established our financial sector in the United States of America, not, not currency. That shifted in the 70s. Okay, I'm sorry, you didn't know that. All right. Help me out here, brother. Thank you, okay. There's your financial brain, okay. Ask him. All right, so anyway, that, so it wasn't talking about the dollar bill. It wasn't about the candid that they put. It was something that was triggered. And I thought, what was triggered? What got triggered that over money that God would start moving and send an angel and somebody saw it with their eyes open? And I thought, how could heaven get that affected over one offering? I thought, there's got to be something more than the currency or commodity. It's not that. Something else is moving. And then I got to studying and I saw this offering business and I thought the first offering establishes all the rest of them. And it wasn't the offering of first fruits. It was the offering of blood. And I thought, God, every time we give, it triggers the offering of blood which is a redemptive offering to cover somebody that has had a situation that they cannot get over themselves and there's nothing they can do about it to change it and there's nothing they can pray hard enough or fast hard enough or do enough for God to try to get rid of it. It's something that has to come from another source and the only thing that triggers it is an offering. And please, don't misunderstand me if your brain already went there. I'm not even talking to you about money. That's not even my point. I'm not even taking an offering. You totally missed it because you allowed philosophy or something from out there to get a hold of your mind. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a trigger point that's happening in this room by reason of a God who made a sacrifice in order to cause propitiation of a covering for something that there's no way we can fix it. No no matter what we do. You can't fix that divorce. You can't fix that bankruptcy. You cannot fix that abuse that already happened. You cannot fix that revenge that got a hold of your heart. He has to heal us. He has to convert us. And then he has to cover us. The victory that he talks about on that precious blood of Christ that 1 Peter 1.19 talks about as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Then Revelation 7 talks about those that came out of that great tribulation have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. I thought blood was red. It's obviously not the component of the actual element. He's referring to a sacrifice, and we know which one that is. That's the one of the cross. That 
is the one that took those stripes on us. So the stuff that we can't heal, you can't heal cancer. You can't heal arthritis. There's no antidote for it. But God said, let me come in here and let me create a covering and let me now, amen, wash you clean with the washing of my word. Let me regenerate something in your spirit that'll cause your brain to connect called the word of God and let me now connect the dots so in the process of it I can get close and when I'm done hell won't be able to find you because I covered you. And they overcame him. 12, 11, revelation by the blood of the lamb. That's your baptism in Jesus' name. If you're baptized some other way, change it. Get rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Nothing else will work. I don't care what you think. It cannot work. It will not work. The demons know it. Demons know baptism in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost doesn't work. Matter of fact, go, go check it out. Right now they're having theological deep discussions whether that should be removed or not because of the original canon of the scriptures. You think the King James Version is the original Bible? Wake up. It's the canon of the scriptures. Boy, some of your brains right now are just rolling all over this carpet. God is trying to communicate. When you get baptized, I pull out that robe. I pull out that robe. Demons have seen it. I got plenty of stories, plenty of stories of when demons watch somebody get baptized, what they do. They freak out. <laughs> if you've been baptized in a Catholic church, get rebaptized. If you've been baptized in a Trinitarian church, get rebaptized. Because there's only Catholics and oneness Pentecostals. Study your history. There's only Catholics and oneness Pentecostals. That's all. My mother-in-law tells me those are our wayward children. Why? Because the first question she asked my wife when she got baptized in Jesus' name was, how were you baptized? Were you rebaptized? Why? Because once you're rebaptized, you're no longer of us. You're of somebody else. Well, I don't believe that. Well, fine. Don't. You won't get covered. Because he won't cover you until he cleanses you. And if you have committed any sin, talks about to the church who's already been baptized. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Man, I ain't ever been more anointed in my life. I'm anointed and I know it. And that's not arrogance and pride. You don't understand it if you think that. God is simply telling you, I desire to cover you. Get baptized in Jesus' name. Or rebaptized. Whatever you need to do. Anybody want to be baptized in Jesus' name? Anybody want to be baptized in Jesus' name? Great. You're going to be baptized in Jesus' name. Wonderful. Anybody else want to be baptized in Jesus' name? Anybody else want to be baptized in Jesus' name? Throw your hand in the air if you want to be baptized in Jesus' name. Anybody else? Okay. God just wanted me to ask right then. God just told me to ask right then. It was for you. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves you. Well, I got to think about it, preacher. No, nope. God's not talking to you. God's not talking to you. Have a nice lunch. I'm not kidding. I'm not being rude either. This is apostolic authority is what you're feeling right now. No, no, you don't understand after you pay some of the price tags I pay, pay, paid last year, that was just one of the sicknesses I had for nine months in a row. Don't even bother me today. 
Don't even bother me today if you want to argue. Don't bother me. Don't waste my time. The Lord God said, devil, because you've done this, every time I remind them of their covering, I'm going to remind you of your destruction. Every time they come up as a blood wash baptized in Jesus name filled with the Holy Ghost individual it's going to remind them of their redemption and I'm going to remind you of your destruction <laughs> hey, hey, let me let's stand let's stand I got way more notes I could go for another 30 40 60 minutes but but the Lord is bringing me to a pause right here I didn't say stop he gives them all that between verses if you want to go back and look at it 14 through 19 of Genesis and he says now I'm going to cover you when I cover you you will have a different identity and I've heard this scripture preached. I've preached it. But I never understood it like I understood it this morning when I looked it up. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, Christians, if you call yourself a Christian, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, you're a Christian. If you're not, then you're Catholic. But you can become Christian. Because your baptism defines who you are. Because your baptism is your identity. It is. And one identifies all the way back to the Catholic Church and the other identifies all the way back to the Apostolic Church in the book of Acts. That's, I mean, study your history. It's just history. I'm not telling you something that's not written. It's written. Up through the 13th Encyclopedia, 13th edition of the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, they used to baptize in Jesus' name. And they are the church that or group that changed the baptism into Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That, that's all. I, I'm not beating anybody up. I'm just giving you facts. Raw history. That's all. Romans 12.1. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, that by the mercies of God, by what mercies? The mercies that God had on you. That you present your what? Bodies. The way you dress well, I, I ain't going to do that. Well, let me help you understand what actually bodies means. That is not just your physical frame. It's actually the word form that comes from accusative form. It is defined as the legal document or proof of what was done for you by the judge. That's actually what the word bodies means. That's the one I was telling you about that word and how accusative has been used over the centuries. And it tells you when it was used less than when it was used more. Most people think of it as accusation. No, no, no. What it's doing, it is accusing somebody, but it's saving somebody else. Because whatever accusation happens in a courtroom redeems somebody and convicts somebody else. That's the accusative. It's not talking about you accusing people of what they did to you. It's talking about accusative form, which is the representation of what delivers somebody and condemns somebody else. Well, who did it condemn back in Genesis? It condemned Satan. He said, this is the accusative form that when you wake up in the morning and you dress to present your body a living sacrifice that I covered, that I redeemed, that I made whole. You're representing my covering, so represent it well. Don't represent it like the world. Don't represent it like Hollywood. Don't represent it like the magazines. Don't represent it like, represent it, amen, like the heavens. Represent it like the kingdom of holiness. Represent it like the kingdom of Christ. Why? Because when you do it and you step out of your house and you walk into your job, you're not just speaking to those people you work with. The entire spirit world is understanding. I can't go there. They're covered. That's my judgment. That's my accusation that's what put it puts me underneath their feet Shh. 
He said, when I brought this propitiation for your sins, but not for yours only, 1 John 2, 2, but also for the sins of the whole world, here in his love, not that we loved God, 1 John 4, 10, but that he loved us and sent his flesh to be the propitiation for our sins that when that blood would start flowing, hell would remember what happened in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says, had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified our Lord. Why? Because when they saw that blood dripping, it brought them all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And they went, no, no, stop it. Get him off the cross. It's too late. The lamb has been slain. And now here comes the covering. Because they know what happens when God covers somebody. There goes your fear. There goes your shame. There goes your guilt. There goes your condemnation. There goes your issue. There goes your trouble. There goes your unrighteousness. There goes your frailty. There goes the fractured. There goes the twigs. There goes the brokenness. There goes the fallen. There goes the tripping. There goes that which was destroyed. There goes that which seems unfixable. So I simply ask you, what do you want God to cover this morning? Nothing or everything? Well, come. Come if you want everything covered. Stay if you don't. It's your choice. It is a choice. I'm simply speaking of a choice. You want everything covered? then bring everything to him. You want everything handled? Then open the chambers that aren't easy to open because you know, hey, he didn't come close to do anything but cover me. And here I come, Lord, because I want you to cover that part. I want you to cover this part. Lord, I'm going to be baptized today so you can cover all parts. Lord, I'm already baptized, but this part has been an issue, so I'm going to expose it so you can cover this part. Come on. Come on, it's okay, come on, come on, it's all right, come on, we're family, come on, it's good, it's good, come on, come on, it's all right, come on, get close, people are trying to get in behind you, people, please, come on, move in, move in as best you can, come on, it's okay, come on, come on, come on, he's going to cover something, he's going to cover something. Now, I want you to expose that something. You don't have to tell somebody. Just lift your hands. Lift your hands and expose that something. Say, here it is, God. Here's what I'm thinking about right now. Here's what I've communicated to you, and I want your covering right here, right now. By the authority of the word of God, by the power of the name of Jesus, by the anointing that is upon us, oh, God, is the body of Christ coming before you. Right here is where God... God fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost right here is where God takes away that thing that was prick, amen, upon your side. That place is the place where God removes that thorn that was in your side. Here's the place where God steps in and covers that thing that was ailed in your body, in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit. That's it. Go ahead. Lift up your voice if you can. Lift up your spirit if you will. Lift up your soul if you're willing.
by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of our Savior, by the blood of redemption, by the blood of Calvary, by the blood that is upon us. I plead the blood of Jesus. 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 Lay your hands on somebody and say it. I plead the blood of Jesus. 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 I plead the blood of the Savior. That's it. Pray. Be healed. In the name of Jesus, I command every sickness to take submission over the blood, under the blood. I command every disease to come into subject obedience by the blood of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the blood... There is healing, there is healing, there is healing, there is a covering happening upon your vessel. That's it. Stretch your hand towards somebody and pray. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Let the Spirit of the Lord right now ministrate something by the Holy Ghost that's upon us in this building. That's it. Let it go. Let the Holy Ghost make that ministry available. You who are baptized in Jesus' name, find somebody you can minister to. (laughs) 